That's the final sermon in this portion of our preaching series on the Acts of the Holy Spirit, which we call Spirit Acts. Kind of a double-handed sort of, sort of little picture of how the Spirit works in the Acts and the fact that the Spirit acts to do things. So we thought it was cute anyway. Now we may be continuing this series into the new year, but actually that's yet to be determined. The preaching team needs to, to meet and we need to sort that through. So we don't know exactly where we're headed into the new year. But next Sunday, Melissa, hopefully she's well, Melissa and I will begin our Advent series based in the genealogy found in Matthew chapter 1. There you will find that four women are specifically mentioned. Interestingly enough, four women and four Advent sermons. Works together quite nicely, we think. The series we are calling We're Expecting. <laughs> so, <laughs> stay tuned for what God may offer us in that series. But moving back to our present series, so far we have looked at how the Spirit of God has poured out, has been poured out and keeps on pouring out into our lives. We've learned how the Holy Spirit is a gift that keeps on giving that the Holy Spirit convict, convicts and fills us, that the Holy Spirit heals and enables us to become healing agents as well. The Holy Spirit breaks free by breaking bondage. And finally, the sixth in our series is the Holy Spirit opens. The Holy Spirit opens doors and creates possibilities. Yes, this is where we end up this morning. The Spirit opens doors and creates possibilities. Now our text from the Psalms, read this morning, finds the psalmist proclaiming the ancient doors must be opened for the power of God to be displayed and magnified. And then in Acts 26, the other reading, uh, what happens there is, is that that reading reveals the Apostle Paul finding himself miraculously in front of, he calls him Kim, King Agrippa, in actual fact he was pro-council Agrippa, renowned Roman general and statesman. His name was actually Marcus Agrippus, a Roman who was actually the power behind the first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, who reigned from 27 B.C. until his death in 14 A.D. Now, how does that happen? How does an obscure, itinerant, part Jew, part Roman tent maker find himself in the presence of one of the most powerful men in that part of the ancient world. How does that happen? And not to mention that while he's there, he has the freedom and the fearlessness to testify to the gospel of Jesus Christ, both in his own life and in its application to the lives of the Roman world, the Gentiles. What doors needed to be opened in miraculous ways in order for that to occur? Actually, in one way, that's what this entire series is about. Our short and relatively shallow dive into the book of Acts has established that this is, in fact, what the Holy Spirit does. It breaks down barriers and open doors. 
intellectual barriers, language barriers, national barriers, racial barriers, financial barriers, psychological barriers, geographical barriers, intellectual barriers, religious barriers, all barriers. Every day, it seems, we walk through different doors, actual doors, just today alone, you may have walked through about five or six different doors, maybe. When you woke up, you walked through your bedroom door. You probably passed through another door when you went into the bathroom. Hopefully, you have a door on your bathroom. <laughs> you walked through another door when you left your house and you came to church. And having arrived here, you may have walked through the narthex doors or the parking lot doors before you reached your seats. In fact, if you try counting the number of doors a person walks through in one's lifetime, it'd probably be thousands and thousands of doors. Now, doors serve two purposes. They provide access or they provide a barrier. They are, in fact, a barrier. They're either an open door or they're a closed door. You need a door to get into a place and come out of a place. Doors help us to get in and out of a room, out of a car, out of a bus, train, an airplane, you name it. Everywhere there's a door, it gives us access or prohibits access this, of course, means that where there is no openable door, a person could be confined or locked up in a particular place, which can and often does speak to this idea of stagnation, of immobility, of being frozen in space and time and place. We all desire growth and progress, in every area of our lives, at least I hope we do. And without open doors, a person can be confined to a particular place or level or spot. Open doors enhance movement. We need open doors to move from one place to another, from one level to another. We need them so that we can be mobile in all ways. They give us access to some blessings, some places. They give us access to people. They give us access to opportunities. In Revelation 3, verse 20, we find Jesus saying these words, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with that person and they with me. In other words, he will come in and be in relationship with us. That there will be synchronicity, they, that we will share together. But what's interesting is that just a few verses before, the writer of the book of Revelation is given these words. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Jesus is described as the one that opens a door which no one can shout, shut, rather, and also the one that shuts a door which no one can open. The message seems to be that we do, in fact, need the power of God to open doors, to break down barriers in order to receive the one who seeks entrance. In a very real sense, we're not able to do it on our own. 
We've had discussions in the past of how we live in a temporal environment. And that so much of what God asks of us and pushes us into is the spiritual world, the supernatural world, the world beyond the temporal, the world beyond the rational, and oftentimes the world beyond our understanding. It is a mystery. When Jesus is described in this way, we understand that in this life, everyone needs Christ to open certain doors and to close others. Now remember, that we have already established that he accomplishes these things through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the facilitator, the agent, the agent of change. And this is the message that the, the Lord shall close every door in your life that needs to be closed. And he shall open all the doors that you need to in order to progress on your spiritual walk, on your spiritual journey, and to be fulfilled in a very real sense in your life. In Isaiah chapter 22, verse 22, these prophetic words inform us. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. Isn't that interesting, almost the precise words that are uttered in the book of Revelation? So also in the spiritual realm, there are keys because many doors that we confront have a key that you use to open it and to lock it. In the spiritual realm, these keys that are used to open certain doors exist in many ways on many fronts. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, God says that he has given us the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now note that he didn't say key, singular, but keys, plural, meaning that more than one key is needed to experience various kinds of doors to be able to get through them, to be able to experience what lies beyond. So how do we know which key works where? We need the ability to, to discern how to get through the barriers in our own lives and in the life of our church. We need the power of the Spirit to identify what the barriers are in our own lives. One key may open one door, say, the door of promotion. But that key may not be able to open the door of healing. You may need to use another key. But all the keys you need have been given to us Plural, because the gift of the Holy Spirit has been given to us, both as individuals, but as a unified body of Christ, as the church. I did say us. I didn't say you. That's exactly why we need each other. Through the Spirit, each of us has been given a gift or gifts that may be able to unlock not only our own particular door, but that of another struggling brother or sister. For example, surely that's why the gift of preaching is given to us and what it's all about. Is it not God's way of speaking into individual lives 
through the exposition of his word, and the exposition of his word is a gift given to a Bible teacher or a teaching elder or a pastor, hopefully. <laughs> what are the keys we need to open the doors that represent our, our deep needs? Victory, deliverance, breakthrough, success, promotion, increase in resources, good health, and peace. And I'm not talking about just our own needs, but those needs that exist around us, in our homes, in our church, in our communities. So let's, let's actually name a few of these keys. Keys that are used by the Holy Spirit to help us unlock closed doors. Well, first off, we have the key of praise. Praise opened the prison doors for Paul and Silas in Acts 16, verses 22 to 27. Paul and Silas found themselves in prison, in a place they needed to get out of. They needed an open door to get out of prison. So what did they do? They started praising God. And what happened? Prison doors opened. These men were lost in praise to God. They were not distracted by the things and the people around them. All their attention was focused on God. Now the praise may not have been the most articulate or expressed in the best singing voices, but it was genuine and it was powerful. As you praise God with everything in you, I believe that doors will open that you never dreamt possible. By definition, praise is not focused on or directed at yourself, is it? Because when you're gazing at yourself or looking, even looking at others around you, you're unable to look up. You're unable to look up and see God. You have this powerful key in your hand. Use it every day and use it well. Now, I'm not sure if any of you remember a gospel music group from the 1970s called the Imperials. Ever heard of the Imperials Quartet? Oh, I've got some head shaking. Wow. <laughs> I loved the Imperials back in those days. <laughs> and I often recall one of the songs from an album that they titled, Heed the Call. And the song was simply called, Praise the Lord. Listen to these lyrics. When you're up against a struggle that shatters all your dreams, and your hopes have been cruelly crushed by Satan's manifested schemes, and you feel the urge within you to submit to earthly fears, don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord. For our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you when you praise him. Now Satan is a liar and he wants to make us think that we are paupers when he knows himself we're children of the king. So lift up the mighty shield of faith for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ has risen. So the work's already done. Praise the Lord. We can work through those who praise him. Praise the Lord for our God inhabits praise. Praise the Lord for the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you that they drop powerless behind you. Praise the Lord. God delights in the praises of his people, so delight in him with your praise, and the Spirit of God 
will do the rest. Next on our list is the key of prayer used by the Holy Spirit. In Acts 12, verses 1 to 7, we have an account of another instance where prison doors were opened. But this time, Peter found himself in prison, a place where he didn't want to be. And he needed an open door to get out of the prison. And it was open because people were praying earnestly for him. In Luke chapter 11, verses 5 to 10, Jesus tells the story of the hungry person who petitions his friend for some food. And at first, it's not forthcoming. But as Jesus points out, because the one in need kept asking, the friend finally got up, opened the locked door, that's exactly what it says, and gave him what he wanted. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Now, when we come across closed doors, we're to knock, to make our needs and those of others known. Knock with our prayers, and the door will be opened for us. Maybe not answered exactly the way you expect them to be answered, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an answer forthcoming. Knock with our prayers. That's what our prayer team does. They faithfully bring individual needs and the needs of our church family before the Lord. Week after week they do that. And led by the Spirit of God, they put the key of prayer in the lock and they open the door. And it's also what you and I can do when we're confronted with a seemingly insurmountable and impossible. Don't give up because you're faced with a closed door. Don't allow closed doors to frighten you or make you feel powerless. Yes, may the Lord give us, through the power of his spirit, grace to utilize the key of prayerfulness. We're moving on to number three. We have the key of discernment. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 8, God had opened a door for the church in Philadelphia. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not Denied my name. Now the door he opened to them was not a physical door that could be seen with human eyes, but it was a spiritual door. We've been down this path together, haven't we? 23 weeks of sitting in this very room seeking God's answers to some of the problems that we have and had in our community. We're asking him to give us voices to express our pain and our concerns. Asking the Spirit of God to help us understand our journey as a Christian community and where some long-standing closed doors needed to be unlocked and open and healing provided. God was faithful. God was incredibly faithful. Looking back on our lives, we can see often, many times, that there are doors that God has opened for us. And sometimes the doors may be right before us, but we can't see them because we lack discernment. Because it takes discernment just to know when a door has been opened for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9, Paul said that a great and effectual door had been opened to him. Paul discerned the great thing God was about to do in his life. Through spiritual insight, he understood that God had gone ahead of him to open certain doors, enabling him to get to certain people and impact their lives. How is it? 
that a half Jew and a half Roman tent maker could end up in front of proconsul Marcus Agrippa. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, a door opened, a door unlocked. Paul brings the subject up again in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12, clearly saying that, quotes, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord, here it is, had opened a door for me. Unquote. He saw this open door because he was in touch with God. His spiritual eyes and ears were working very well, synchronized with the Spirit of God. In other words, he was attuned to the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. If Paul didn't discern and perceive this open door, he may never have gotten to those whom God wanted him to reach for Christ. Do you know that it's entirely possible for you to be praying for an open door and yet, meanwhile, God has already opened it? Without discernment, we won't know which doors God has opened for us. We need that key. How are we able to do that without using the key of discernment to open the doors he has arranged for us to go through? Now we must ask the Spirit to remove the scales. What are the scales on our eyes? Sometimes the scales of bigotry, entrenched belief systems, embedded theology, scales that keep us blinded to possibilities. And when I say that, do not interpret me as saying that we give up our doctrines or our core beliefs, because I am not saying that. But what I am saying is there are times we fail to see what is obviously in front of us, because we refuse to see it. What is the saying? There are none so blind as those who cannot see maybe will not see. We may miss the divine opportunity that's right before our eyes. Pray God that that does not happen. We need the key of discernment. And then number four, we need the key of courage. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 says this, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Courage comes from trusting God. It comes from believing what God says, regardless of what the circumstances look like. Courage comes from faith. And where does discouragement come from? From fear and unbelief. It comes when you listen to the devil's lives about what God is supposedly not going to do for you. Now the key, the key is to stop looking at our own abilities or disabilities our own failures or our own limitations and start looking at the attributes of God. As much of them as we can understand. And what we can understand is enough. It takes courage to walk through open doors. Without courage, you could be staring at an open door right in the face, yet not walk through it because you're afraid of what's behind the door. Afraid of the unknown, afraid of what will happen if you walk through the door, if you actually seize that opportunity. I know this because I've been that person standing at a door, refusing to walk through because I'm afraid, frozen, in my fearfulness. I've been there. 
In Psalm 24, verses 7 and 8, which we read this morning, we are told of ancient gates. They are like doors that have been closed for a long time. Doors that need to be opened. And it took courage for the psalmist, psalmist to start addressing these ancient gates and telling them to open for the king of glory to come in. The psalmist didn't allow the size of these ancient gates to intimidate him, nor did he allow the length that they had remained closed to frighten him. All he was concerned about was getting those ancient gates opened. He knew that for the gates to open, he had to confront them boldly and courageously through the power of the Spirit of God. His courage was the key to unlocking those strongholds. So may we receive courage through the power of the Holy Spirit to confront all doors standing before us that need to be opened. We even need the power of the Spirit as a key to unlock an understanding of what doors need to be opened. May we be courageous enough to pass through every door God opens, irrespective of how challenging the door looks or what may lie on the other side. May he grant us the courage through faith to unlock and step through the door. And finally, number five, the key of generosity. And this, this is a very powerful key to which I, I uh, indicated this morning when we received our tithes and offering. The gift of generosity. Giving can open doors that you can't even imagine. Just look at the great door that barred all of humankind from a relationship with their creator. The great barrier of our own sin. The key that unlocks that door is the generosity of God himself. He gave us the gift of salvation that has been open to millions of people because God gave his only, his one and only son to die on a cross for us, on our behalf. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 10, we are told of how giving of one's tithes can open the floodgates of heaven. These gates can be likened to doors or blessings that we need opened to us and to others. Yeah, it pays to be generous. If we take our giving to another level, we'll discover what God will do in our own lives and actually in the life of Queensway Baptist Church. Again, I give you Jesus' words in Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I didn't say that. God's son said that. The key to opening the door of God's great blessings is to heed those words. So in conclusion... You'll observe that doors come in different sizes and designs. They can be made of wood. They can be made of glass. They can be made of iron. Some are very thick while some are light. Some doors are common and plain while others can be huge and menacing. Noticeable doors because of their massiveness. Today, as we stand on the word of God and declare it over our lives, all closed doors, no matter their size, no matter their texture, no matter the force of darkness, working to see that the doors remain shut, 
all of those doors will burst open through the power of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit opens. I believe with all my heart that as we become people of praise, prayers, discernment, courage, and as we give lovingly and sacrificially, God will open doors of favor, of blessings, of opportunities, of graciousness, of love, and of caring. That is my prayer for all of us here at Queensway Baptist Church. In Jesus' name, amen.